Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, I'm really glad you're here today. How are you doing? This is a really chock full episode by researcher and author Esther Bergsma, who has just written a book. She has a few of them, but the most recent one that she's written is called The Brain of the Highly Sensitive Person. We talk a lot about her research in this episode, and some of the questions that we talk about are, is the trait of being a highly sensitive person due to trauma? I'm seeing stuff all over social media, and we talk about this, and she talks about the research. The other thing we talk about that I really hadn't delved into much before is, we know that the trait of being sensitive has been identified in over 100 animal species, but I really hadn't ever heard much about what that looks like, and We talk about that. She has a great analogy. I think it's a metaphor. (laughs) I'm not sure which one it is. For if you're a highly sensitive person related to animals and the perspective shifting, I think it's pretty powerful. Esther talks about social rejection. And we also talk about the negative messages that we get around being a highly sensitive person. And she talks about the corresponding talents for the following statements. If somebody says you're too emotional, you're not enthusiastic enough you don't make decisions, it's impossible to make up my mind, you need to step up for yourself, you're too hard on yourself, you're not able to stick to a task. So she takes each one of these and talks about the corresponding talents. We talk about why it's important for professionals to understand about the trait of being highly sensitive and the most common misdiagnoses if you are highly sensitive and you have a practitioner who is not familiar with the trait. I just think that this is an episode that you're really going to love. Esther was a guest on episode 35, and it's one of the most downloaded episodes. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Let me tell you a little bit about Esther. Now, in Dutch, there's a term that they use before her name, and because I don't speak Dutch, I'm not going to say it, but it's the equivalent of having a Master of Arts degree. Esther Bergsma is a Dutch expert on high sensitivity a researcher in the field of social science and the inspiring force behind Ugen Sensitief Netherlands. She coaches and trains professionals in understanding and guiding HSPs better. She has written several books on high sensitivity. Her book called The Brain of the Highly Sensitive Person is in English and can be ordered on Amazon. If you like the phrase unapologetically sensitive, I have some merchandise in my store at patriciayounglcsw.com. There's some amazing stuff in there if you're interested in getting some merch to support being unapologetically sensitive. If you stay tuned at the end, I'm going to talk about a giveaway to get Esther's book. And now, on to the show. Hey, Esther, welcome. Hello. I'm excited to have you back again. So glad you invited me, Patricia. Thank you. You're very welcome. If you want to know about Esther being an HSP, you can go back to episode 35 where she had an amazing, it's one of the most downloaded episodes. So you can go back to that. And we're just going to jump in today. Esther, is being a highly sensitive person due to trauma? No, it isn't. Uh, I hate it a lot. I understand why people think it is because when you did experience a trauma, It's visible in your behavior, in your thoughts, in your stress system. Uh, So it looks like what HSPs experience. But we know from research that being a highly sensitive person is being wired differently. We can see that when we ask people to take place in an fMRI and they do tasks and we see differences between the brains. But then you can say, well, it can still be caused by trauma. So then it's very interesting to look at research amongst four-month-old babies where we see a big difference in how they react to new situations. And what I think is is a very strong uh, support of my point is uh, the research done uh, in the biological uh, field 
there are uh, hundreds of studies about uh, how animals behave in different situations. For example, when there is a new food or um, a trap. And biological researchers see two different behavioral patterns. And one is that the animals go to the new food and explore and are curious about it. And the other group within each species is much more cautious, is uh, looking at clues, whether it's danger or not, and and are very, uh, sometimes sit for a very long time and look around. So there is a a clear distinction between those two groups within more than a hundred different species. So it's from from dogs, uh, cats, uh, but also fish and fruit flies and all kinds of animals. And what's really mind-blowing is that uh, the division between those groups, that the the group that's going at it right away, it's about 80%. The other group is about 20%. It's the same amount as HSPs we know from the human world. And what's more uh, important is that from the biological research, Uh, they calculated the best division between those groups and they concluded that the cautious groups should not be too big, but it shouldn't be too small. It shouldn't be below 20. 20 is the ideal percentage in all those species to survive, to let this, um, yeah, that species survive. So, one, I think that's that's a yeah freaking idea about uh, how we should uh, work together as humans. But the second is, well, if animals are wired differently into two groups, uh, well, we can be fairly sure that's not caused by trauma. So that's why we say that in humans it's from birth on and not trauma. And I want to make the distinction that If you have an animal, there's a trap set out with a novel food. If you have an animal that's part of that 20% of the species that's more cautious, they are not going to be the one that runs in to try the new food and get caught. It's the other 80% that are likely to be curious and to not move with caution. And those are the ones that are going to get trapped. And so I'm not an expert in the animal species, but I just want to give an example of how this works that oftentimes I think in the sunfish, they were called timid or bold. And the ones that were timid were not the ones that got caught. The ones that were bold would forge ahead, but often would get caught or trapped. And so the way that high sensitivity can show up in animals is in horses, they're the ones that are going to alert the herd that there's danger ahead, as opposed to just forging through in a new area. You, I'll let you talk a little bit more about it, but I just want to demonstrate how this shows up in animals and how this can be translated to people. Yeah. It's really different in how they experience those new situations. And the example from the horses that you you gave, they are alerting the others. But what's really interesting is the terms that the, the groups are giving. You mentioned it as well, timid versus bulls. But timid doesn't have a, a, a very good sound about it. But when you say cautious or when you say sensible or when you say responsive, it sounds a lot different. Most of the research is is with perhaps a bit of prejudice about the behavior. But ideal division between 20 and 80 gave the biological researchers the idea, okay, it's both very necessary. It's not about good behavior, bad behavior, but it's both very important for surviving. Right. Can you talk a little bit about, I'm I'm thinking back to people now. So if there's a child who's highly sensitive and then there is trauma or it can even be misattunement by a parent that Dr. Aaron's research shows then those HSPs have higher rates of anxiety and depression. But can you talk a little bit about how differential susceptibility plays into this? And, And I suspect that this is where people get confused about being an HSP and trauma due to differential susceptibility. What do you think? Yeah, we know that a, a person, a highly sensitive person, is more susceptible to their environment. So when you are growing up in an unhealthy environment, a toxic environment, a, a manipulative environment, as a highly sensitive child, you are affected by it. So the highly sensitive children are much more affected by trauma 
other children can have trauma as well, but won't yeah it it won't be such such visible effects on them. So the highly sensitive child is attuned to their parents, and when they experience trauma, they will be extra attuned because it's for their own safety to know what their parents will be doing. So you see the patterns aggravated, um, exacerbated. Yeah. Yeah. Made worse. Yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. And if you put a highly sensitive person in an environment that really meets their needs, then we do better than the non HSPs. That's the other side of differential susceptibility. And I want to let you explain it. This is your, I'm just repeating what I've heard. So <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, that's really important to, to, to realize because. A lot of times we talk about the negative aspects and about being overwhelmed and about being stressed easily. But in good circumstances and with good parenting, highly sensitive children flourish and they have better health, better physical and better mental health. They uh, have better school outcomes. So... um yeah, they're responsive to their environment. And it's not only in the bad environments that, that affect them, but also the good ones. And when you're a parent, it's really good to know that it's just in those little things that you can make a difference to go from a bad situation for a child to a good situation and really get different outcomes. Right. And good enough parenting only has to be 30%. So we're not talking about being the perfect parent. And I talk to a lot of parents who are concerned because... They're also highly sensitive. They get overwhelmed. They feel limited in their ability to deal with their kids. We can still communicate that. We can always go back in and do repair work. So I want to be clear that when we talk about good parenting, we're not talking about perfect parenting. No. We're talking about being able to name, mommy was really tired. Mommy was really overwhelmed. I'm sorry, mommy got very angry. I mean, I'm going to talk about mommy because I'm a mommy. I'm not a daddy. But we don't have to do it perfectly in that repair work and going in and naming if there was a rupture or something happened is just as valid as, quote, perfect parenting, which doesn't exist. No, it doesn't exist. And the research by Elaine Arendt and colleagues uh, shows that it's about being able to sense the needs of your child. And of course, you're not all, always able to fulfill them, but when you can sense them and are at most times able to to talk about uh, them with your kids or to to help them on the path to yeah to get themselves on what they need that's good enough you can't be perfect and you don't have to be perfect was there anything else about animal studies that we wanted to talk about no i think the main point is that we see hsp or high sensitivity amongst animals i think that's a really important uh Thing to remember, and yeah, we really uh, talk about uh, on, uh, with professionals, uh, for example, doctors or psychologists, is that those division between tasks within a species that we should look more about uh, to that because sometimes we interpret the behavior from the the minor group, the twenty percent HSPs, as being something wrong about it. But when you look at the, the biological research, it's much clearer to see that those talents are as important to as, as a whole society as the other 80%. Do you want to just go ahead and give the example that you use in your book about the fish and climbing trees? and Because I think it really illustrates what we're talking about. And I love concrete examples. Well, what I see, what I hear from a lot of HSPs is when they, they look for help, when they're, uh, when they're stuck and they go to, to the doctor or to the psychologist or, or whoever, they talk about their complaints. And uh, in the book, I, I use the metaphor of a fish and uh, he goes to another animal, uh, perhaps a fox, a fox versus a fish. And uh, the fox has his own experience. So when, when a fish says, well, I uh, sometimes I can't breathe and uh, it's all too much for me. And uh, I have a choking sensation and accelerated breathing. Well, the fox thinks, okay, you've just run too hard. You have to, to calm down. It doesn't know the perspective of the fish and uh, doesn't know it, it can be, uh, well, uh, chill flukes. It's about the quality of the water. Uh, so it, it looks in directions 
to help the fish, but from its fox perspective. I think that a lot of uh, pills that are prescribed for HSPs about anxiety disorder, about depression, about a compulsion, that if care providers know more about being highly sensitive on what it means, that those prescriptions aren't necessary. But when you think, okay, when someone is that cautious, well, when I'm that cautious, there's something really wrong with me. So there's really something really wrong with this person. So he'd better suppress it. I think that's a real problem in our society. Because, yeah, okay, sometimes being too cautious is, is trouble <laughs> for your surroundings or for yourself. But there is a quality in it. It's about being able to detect all those those fine details about the surroundings that hmm, maybe point to danger. Absolutely. Just for clarification, I think in the Netherlands and here in the States, we say gills differently because I think I heard you say jills, which is fine. I just wanted to make sure that if you're not from the Netherlands, that what Esther was talking about is that the fish gills, that the fish isn't breathing and the fox interprets that as the fish being out of breath, but it's an entirely different process that the fox can't understand because the fox doesn't live in water. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and some of the things I just did a little TikTok about, I saw somebody do a whole thing on overthinking. So following this example that you're giving that somebody who doesn't understand the trait may look negatively at things like not letting things go or overthinking or people pleasing. I mean, people pleasing to me is a trauma response. It's about codependency. We are deep thinkers. And when we're trying to problem solve, we are going to chew things over until we get it right. We're going to look at it from every angle. And that's not necessarily negative. We want to talk to the person. And there, for me, there's a place where I can get on to kind of negatively ruminating about things in a way that's not helpful, that kind of hits a wounded place. And another thing in this person, and what about, or anticipatory conflict, and I'm trying to figure it out, that isn't always helpful. And when something goes on, I just want to run it over and over and over until I figure it out and I know that's okay. But if I'm around people that don't get that, they're going to tell me I've got OCD, that I'm being obsessive, that I'm not letting things go. We get a lot of negative messaging, which is why it's so important for us to have these conversations, for HSPs to understand their traits and to educate providers so that they don't misdiagnose people or try and get them to stop doing what we are really good at. Yeah. It's a really important subject that you uh, bring up, uh, especially that the overthinking. Oh, the times we hear about, oh, don't be so complex, just let it go. <laughs> but our highly sensitive brain isn't able to let go. We know from the MRI studies that the default mode network, that it's a brain area that is not, uh, that is active when there's not a task at hand. So it's about mind wandering. It's about uh, thinking back. It's about auto autobiographic memories. It seems to be a very important network in the brain uh, when it comes to combining things and about making the good connections between the different things that you have noticed. And uh, we see that in the brain scans. So when we look at the, um, the daily practice, well, sometimes it's, it's annoying for, for you as an HSP to do. So it can be too much. But the quality behind it is that you will uh, have creative solutions for things others don't have because they are not thinking it through. They're not combining all those little things. And uh, giving that as a message to an HSP is so completely different than, than saying, oh, stop thinking about it. Just let it go. It's it's not helpful. Yeah. And we can't. You think, you know, there are times when I was told, like, just let it go. You're too analytical. Stop worrying about it. You think if I knew how to do that when it's bothering me that I would do that? I mean, as I've grown and learned about my traits, I do have tools to be able to manage so that I don't always suffer. But it's such an unkind thing for people to say when they don't understand, because again, it's that thing of not being able to understand that they may be able to do that, but their brains aren't wired the way that our brains are. Yeah. Yeah, correctly. And uh, of course, I do think that, that, that you can learn yourself to to cope with it differently. So your brain is wired that way and it will overthink, but you can put a halt to it by some techniques such as uh, journaling, uh, making lists, uh, meditating before you go to sleep. So you you just ease your brain and it won't 
keep you out of your sleep. Mm -hmm. Those things, mindfulness, and oftentimes they just have to remind myself that I can come back and solve that problem later and I can just do a gentle redirect. Exercise really seems to help doing any kind of exercise, having downtime is really important. But I find that my brain kind of likes to have stimulation. It kind of likes to have stuff to chew on. And, and so I just have to be a little mindful about what I'm feeding it. <laughs> well, that's the other uh, side of it, because when you, when there is nothing to think about, well, you, you will be itchy as well, because yeah, there's nothing to do <laughs> for your brain. So it's uh, yeah, it's sometimes looking for things. Before, uh, for example, in your partner, and you get annoyed by him uh, on things that that weren't annoying ever before. But your <laughs> your brain needs some things to uh, yeah to put their teeth in. I don't know if that's an expression in uh, in English. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is. It is. Yeah, I find especially during COVID that we have a front porch, and I just love sitting in the chair out there and really not doing anything, which is one of the few ways of relaxing and watching people walk by. It's just something that I really enjoy. It's nice right now. It's warm. So that's definitely a way of getting a little bit of downtime. Sounds good. Yeah. It's a bit too cold here. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Can we talk a little bit about social rejection? Yeah, it's another topic that I think a lot of HSPs recognize uh, for themselves. Social rejection is the feeling that you don't belong to people you're hanging out with. And one of the reasons that HSP experience it as much as they do is because, well, they're wired that way. Same as what we talked about. Uh, what we see in the brain is that uh, the social areas are activated much more and much more often. So it's almost automatically that you, when you are in a company, it may even be an online company, uh, that your brain is asking itself, is it okay for the other? Do I belong to the group? Uh, did I make any social mistake? How about the harmony in the group? Is everybody feeling fine? And that's more important than asking about yourself. Is it in my interest? Uh, am I good with it? Uh, so that's our natural way of of analyzing uh, the situation in which we're in. So same as, as what we talked about, that it's really helpful to learn when to stop that. You are wired that way, so those thoughts will come to you, but you can put a hold on it. On top of that, some people are extra anxious about that. They are, uh, they have, I'm sorry. Um, Is it rejection sensitivity dysphoria? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Rejection sensitivity. That can be aggravated by uh, the upbringing, by former relationships, and can also be induced by stress. Because when we are under stress, we have a biological system that is, well, in this case called cytokines, uh, that the amount of us that we take rest, that we retract from the social group, but at the same time, we are anxious about, we still belong to the group and we want to make sure that someone is looking after us. So the group is really important at that moment. So stress in itself will trigger our brain to be sensitive about those social clues. So when you have been under a lot of stress as an HSP, uh, well, I experienced that. And those social things can be really big <laughs> when just uh, some eye movement or some text message, I can freak out because I think, oh my God, it's going the wrong way. So that's that's something to, to keep in mind as an HSP, that it's plus, plus, plus. And um, you have to get yourself a little bit down on that and to keep it in perspective. Well, I think we have this ability in a social situation that we're present to what's going on, but then we have what I call my gremlins. Am I talking too much? Am I not talking much? Am I smiling enough? Am I responding enough? And then we leave the situation, then we tend to really beat up on ourselves about whether we said enough or didn't say too much. I I think that's just a really common part of being an HSP. What are your thoughts? It's like we're um, we're looking at ourselves and we're judging ourselves about being good enough or being kind enough or being caring enough. That is something that can be a talent and can be used in many uh, occasions, but can also be a nuisance because 
it's it's really difficult to to just be and to just enjoy the social group you're in. Yeah, what I find is I have the wound of being a fear of being too much, which also is the fear of not enough. So the way that the too much is I'm going to talk too much, I'm going to take too much space up, or I go into nobody's going to notice if I'm not there, my presence doesn't matter. Oftentimes, the people that have this wound, we tend to do a lot of self-monitoring. Am I listening? Am I responding? And when I feel relaxed enough that I'm not monitoring, it's that it's it's almost that experience. I, I don't drink, but I would imagine if you black out and you do stuff and you're, you don't know what you did because you don't remember, there's almost this fear of if I relax enough and I'm not monitoring, am I going to be too much when we feel comfortable enough that we just kind of relax? I honestly believe for me, you know, the too much, not enough is wounding. That's not about being an HSP. That's about messages that I got about my feelings being too big for my caregivers to manage and all my feelings are okay. For me, the wound still comes up, but in the relationships that are close enough and safe enough, I can say, I feel like I'm talking too much. Can I get a reality check from you? We can't do that in all situations. And if it's a situation where I can't do that, I've learned to give that internal reassurance of you're fine, it's okay, you know, you're not talking too much. So even if we have these wounds or you're relating to what we're talking about, it doesn't have to be on a 10 where it rattles us and it is very dysregulating that we can learn to manage it and do some healing around it. Yeah, it's, it's really important to to know this about yourself, to know that there is a wound and that it's, it's hurt in some situations. And we all have wounds. We all have things that are... Uh, have been so uh, so painful for us that when it's just uh, touched, we we don't know what to do. And uh, of course, that's for everyone. That's not just for HSPs. But as an HSP, you are overthinking this as well, the social interaction. And I think when you notice, when you recognize this for yourself, that's it's really helpful to to get this pattern. Uh, visible for yourself so knowing what is going on what is happening and then you are you will be able in in future situations to react more relaxed yeah i think mindfulness being able to observe what's happening what those processes are and we're so good at this but to do it without judgment with self-compassion and then to be able to either step in and reassure ourselves or if we need to work with somebody to talk about it was in this situation and this is what my thinking was and then you get some tools around it that even though there are things that we struggle with if you're human you're going to struggle with stuff it just may not be this stuff so we all have work to do and it's just learning how to work with it where it's like oh it's that thing again what do i need to do okay and then we you know it becomes more manageable yeah, yeah it is yeah for me it's about being loved am i being loved is there someone who loves me in all the little ways, not just a big love, but am I worth it? Does someone care for me in the world? Now that I know that is going on, I, I can see myself reacting uh, sometimes aggressively, just in situations which I need so much as a vulnerable woman. But I think as an HSP, when you overthink things and you have had messages in your childhood about being worth it or being uh, too much or whatever the message was it gets louder in your mind so you it's much much more difficult to uh, to ignore those messages it's my opinion uh, when you're HSP so um, there's two things we should be really considerate about what we tell highly sensitive children and be uh, very conscious about the effects it has on them and for the adults, we should be aware that working on those wounds and about and working on the impact of those messages can really help get a lot of pain and a lot of problems and behavioral problems repaired uh, in the adult life. But we really need to be vulnerable and open about that to, to let that happen. Yeah, this is probably a language thing. But even when you said overthinking, there was a part of me that went like... <gasps> You know, like that just felt like, it's just what my brain does. It processes. It's not overthinking. And like I said, it may be a language a language thing, but I'm just even sharing that I had that response when you said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> I really understand it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I use words to myself when I think, well, I, I, I wouldn't think it's okay when someone else said this, says this to me because that's the wrong word. But I uh, yeah, sometimes use it for myself when I shouldn't. We should be more uh, aware of what we say and how we describe what is going on. So thank you for your feedback. Yeah, it's really important. Oh, no, no, no. And and like I said, I, I because this is English, that's not your first language. I don't know what words you would use. And yeah, this helps ease us into the next thing we're going to talk about. Can we talk about some of the negative messages that we get as HSPs? And if we can tie this in a little bit too, if you do have children that are highly sensitive, what are some ways that we can language things or work with kids so that they don't turn into wounded adults like I am. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, it's important as a parent not to talk about the negative aspects, but to see the talent behind it. So not about overthinking, but uh, about you are thinking things through. You're very uh, deliberate. You're very... Uh, you, you choose your words very well. That sounds so different. Uh, not about being shy or something, but about being mm-hmm. need some time to to adjust, need some time to to feel comfortable. And I think when we we use those positive words, we send a completely different message to our children, and it gives the child language to describe what they need. I like to take time when I'm in a new situation, as opposed to saying shy. I I, I don't ever use the word shy, please. But we help provide language so that kids understand what they need. And I know for me, even as an adult, that I often have to tell, like, if I have a new vet, I need to do problem solving and I need to kind of play devil's advocate. That's how I sort things out. And I've had vets think that I'm being combative with them. And it's just how I need to problem solve to see all angles so I don't get it's not overwhelmed, but that's just how I see things. And so when I know that this is how my brain works and this is how it's going to work well to work with me and I can let people know, then they relax and they don't think that I'm arguing with them. So being able to describe what we need or what our process is, I I don't go, I'm a highly sensitive person, but I do know what traits or what kinds of things help me in a new situation. Yeah, it's really important to describe what's going on. So say to the child, okay, you need... Uh, time to think about what you want to do on your birthday or on this special weekend and not be disappointed that your child doesn't immediately say, oh, yeah, yeah, I uh, I can choose something. Well, I want to do this. It's not a lack of ent- enthusiasm. It's It's needing the time to overthink all the possibilities that there are. And you can rephrase it in a positive way. And it also helps the child to understand what's going on in itself, because when it looks at the other kids around him, it, that it will do it at, at some age, he might think, wow, it's, it's different f- for me. Is there something wrong? But when the parents have used the words to describe why it's different, it won't be a problem because it's obvious just need some more time. Yeah, We can um, make a big difference just by using those words and not just parents, but in schools as well. When teachers talk differently to, to the kids at school or child counselors uh, talk differently to, to their clients, it makes a big difference. Yeah. What are some of the negative messages that you hear that HSPs have heard that they've internalized? I mean, we've talked about some of them, like you think too much, you worry too much. What are some of the messages that you commonly hear from HSPs? And then we can kind of work backwards with those. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're too emotional. You make a big drama out of everything in in line with that. Do you want to, to trace them back to the talent or just? Um, Let's get the list and then we'll go back to the talents. Yeah. You're you're not enthusiastic. <laughs> you can't make decisions. You're impossible to to make up your mind. You uh you can't step up for yourself. You can't let things go. You're so harsh on yourself. You're always so harsh on yourself. You can't stick to the to the task. You always have to do extra things. <laughs> Those are the most common uh, remarks they get. Okay. 
So let's let's take them and work backwards. So you're too emotional. Yeah, what's the talent? <laughs> yeah, I think the talent is emotion, being emotional, because everything around you makes something happen in your brain and and in your body. Those communicate, of course, and. The emotions give you clues about what's important to you and what should be a good decision. So it it helps you make the right choices and it helps you make a distinction between what's good and what's not good. So as an HSP, we, we feel immediately if someone is trustable or not. And emotions help us in a more difficult situation when things are really complex and we can't put a finger on it, our emotions tell us it's not okay. Or there is something that we need to focus on to be sure it's okay. Or just that idea that people that don't feel things deeply want to stop it in us, but they don't say, I don't feel things as deeply as you, and I don't like when you do that, so you're being too sensitive, you're being too emotional. It's, again, that situation with the fox and the fish, that just because you don't feel things as deeply as I do doesn't mean that it's wrong, because I can't tell you how many people tell me, you know, I just have always been told I'm too sensitive, and it's like, yeah, and tell me more about that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, a lot of people will tell you as a manager, you shouldn't have too much emotions. You you can't be emotional. You just have to make the decisions. But, uh, well, has it brought us anything <laughs> the last couple of decades? I don't think so. When I really believe that leaders who are uh, feeling deeply will make other decisions, well, uh, um, other kind of decisions. I won't say better, but it will bring us something. And uh, when you're not feeling anything, well, you, you, you think it's a problem when you do feel, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's not a perspective, just as you said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How about you're not enthusiastic enough? That's about not being eager to do something new, not being on your feet immediately as someone suggested something. Well, that's that's um, uh, going through your mind about what's, what are the pros and cons of this day out that we're about to do, what's going to happen, uh, what might go wrong, uh, what should I take, what should I prepare for. So it's it's a thinking about future things. And of course, it's very handy if someone is thinking about that and, and, and packing the right stuff for your day out. So what should we call it? What What is a good uh, word for that? We're good planners. Yeah. Yeah. We're the ones that have band-aids and aspirin and <laughs> safety pins and snacks and a change of underwear and <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you can't make decisions? Uh it's a bit about what we talked about. When you ask an HSP on the spot what's your decision, it's most HSPs are not good at that because they want to think through, they want to know what the consequences are, they want to make sure they're not overlooking anything. Well, they're very deliberate about their uh, decision, well-considered uh, decision-making, I would say. But the common uh, the common perspective is that it's good to make quick decisions, to be able to oversee things immediately and, and, and make that decision. But, well, I would have some more <laughs> well-considered decisions in this world, <laughs> I have to say. Mm-hmm. Okay. How about you can't step up for yourself? Yeah, I think it's about understanding other one, other's perspectives. It's about that social context I was telling about that our brain is is automatically uh, asking itself what what the consequences are for the social group, and our own perspective is perhaps some yeah on the second or perhaps even the third place. I think it's that is something that uh, some HSP most HSPs needs to work on because. It's uh, it, it can be a really disadvantage in your personal uh, growth. And at the same time, it's a, it's a real talent that you look at what's best for mm-hmm. someone else first. I find that as HSPs are really allowed to flourish and to get clear on what they're thinking and feeling and needing, because we are in the minority, we often look to the outside to figure out what is the other 80% doing and what's the expectation that we're really good at picking up on cues and showing up in the way that the other 80% does. But it takes time to learn what do I need? What's good for me? How can I take care of myself? And when we do that, I think it makes it easier to set boundaries and to take care of ourselves. I also think that this aspect of being an HSP, that sense of 
when we look to how are others doing a sense of justice and equanimity and fairness, this time in the world right now can be really hard for us because it feels like there is so much that is just not fair and just. And I think that we can get empathy overload because of that, because we really have this sense of like, everything should be fair and things should look differently. I think it's, it in some ways is a very, very difficult time for HSPs right now. Yeah, we feel all those injustice and feel powerless to to do something about it. And mostly it's not about injustice that's done to us, but to mm -hmm. our society or our group or our, our family. Or, well, again, it's it is a good a good trait to feel so deeply for someone else and to be willing to fight for those rights and to. Uh, to make things better. Yeah. And I think that if there are things, if it's political, if it's social justice, that there are things that we can do on kind of the macro level, and there are things that we can do on an individual level that do give us a sense of power and control of what can I do personally to help some of these areas where I have injustice. But I, I think it it really has been a very hard time for HSPs this last year or two. Yeah, it has. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about you're so hard on yourself? That's uh, the talent uh, for self-reflection. When uh, we are in a new situation, we, we perceive things subtle, subtle details uh, will come to us. We process those things uh, deeply and we think about them afterwards. That's self-reflection. That's asking ourselves, did we do the right thing? Did we consider this enough? And we uh, get feedback that's a negative thing, that we shouldn't be so harsh on ourselves, that we shouldn't always think back about things that has happened. We can't do anything about it anymore. But at the same time, self-reflection is one of the traits that help us improve, that help us grow and help us get different results the next time. So I think in the personal growth that uh, I don't have any statistics about it, but I, I believe that uh, on personal growth, HSP uh, have a, a very steep uh, line. They, they improve themselves just because they're wired that way. They want to do better. They want to, to add more to wherever they are. And you should be proud of that again, I think. Yeah, and... Research shows that 50% of clients in therapy are highly sensitive, and those are your clients that come on time, that pay on time, that love doing homework, that are always learning and growing, that are really invested in learning about themselves and how many of us have self-help books on our bookshelves and we listen to podcasts because we really love learning and growing, and that is definitely a, a strength to you know this other part. It is, yeah. Yeah. And then the last one is, uh, I can't stick to a task. And yeah, I wrote something, but I can't, I can't read my writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about, well, perhaps in high school or at work, when you get an assignment, and you have all those ideas, okay, is this a question? Or, or, or should we do that? Or, oh, if you look at it that way, we can also include this or this or that. And it's that creative thinking, that's the talent behind it, that makes us look at it very differently than, than others. And others see, oh, she's doing a lot of things. Uh, she just had to do this task, stick to your task and just do that. But most HSPs notice so many connections. It doesn't uh, seem right just to do the task. They They feel as if they are... Uh, failing if they're just doing the task because, well, what's the point of, of only that task when there's so much more to think of and to combine it with? Yeah. I always have this expectation that my thinking should be linear and it's not. I am not a linear person. And I have so many clients that will say, I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over the place from subject to subject, but I track them. And I think that it's the way our brains work that we're making all of these connections that to the observer they wouldn't understand why we're jumping from this to that to that. But there is, I often will tell my husband, we'll be walking the dogs and I come up with something and then I trace the thread back. And there is a tangent thread that I see, but nobody else would probably see it. Yeah, that's what we see in the MRI with HSPs. There are a lot of brain networks, brain areas activated. And 
uh, when we look at the specific brain networks, we see it's it's those uh, networks that combine things that make the connections, and and that's the reason why that why you jump to all kinds of other subjects uh, during a conversation. But that is a good point as well. It makes you able to to see those creative, ingenious solutions that nobody else is see. Mm-hmm. I often will tell my husband, we do most of our talking when we walk the dogs. And so I often will tell him, <laughs> here's what the topic is, because where I start is not anywhere near what the topic is, so that he knows like, <laughs> this is where we're going to be landing. But I take a very circuitous route, I'm sure from his perspective, but it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about why it's so important for professionals to know about the trait of being a highly sensitive person and what are the common misdiagnoses that HSPs get when professionals are not familiar with the trait? I think there are a couple of reasons why uh, care providers should know a lot more about high sensitivity. Uh, First of all, I noticed that a lot of them uh, have some idea about high sensitivity, but there are false presumptions because they don't know the research and they know, don't know the the details about this trait. And uh, when you don't know what the trait is really about, you are probably, presumably, sending the wrong messages to your client. You might say, well, you're overthinking this way too much and overthinking, we just um, uh, said. It's not that what's going on. It's the liberation, it's about combining, it's about, and uh, so in the process of where you're, you are guiding your clients, it's, it's really important to use the right words. The third is that when you don't have any knowledge about high sensitivity, but you do have knowledge about diagnosis such as ADHD or autism or borderline or whatever, and you look at the behavior and the problems that the, the client will will tell you about, you can probably check all the boxes from those diagnoses. So there is a real risk that the wrong diagnosis will be given. And uh, there has been some research by James Webb about uh, the gifted and, and a misdiagnosis. And he says it's about 50% that gets a diagnose that he shouldn't have, he or she shouldn't have. And I guess, I presume, where I don't have the numbers yet, that's the same case for, for highly sensitive persons. Because when you, you're you not looking at behavior alone, but you when you're looking at why does that behavior occur? Is it because uh, the way the brain works or is it because other things that, that, that are not developed well? Then you see a big difference between those different diagnoses and the trait high sensitivity. And when you have pinpointed that, you can work completely differently with the client than when you have this perspective from the diagnosis that you think it is. Yeah. So that's the third reason. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're good. I was just going to list off some diagnoses and was going to ask you, do you think that people get diagnosed with these things when they may in fact be highly sensitive. Can we play this game? Mm-hmm. I yeah, wish I had yeah. some game show music to cue in. <laughs> <laughs> Bipolar disorder. Yeah. And you said borderline personality disorder. Depression? Yeah, yeah as well. Yeah. Anxiety? Yeah, Obsessive compulsive disorder? It might be. It's it's uh, not that clear as the other ones. Yeah, and then you mentioned ADHD and autism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We hear a lot of stories in the Netherlands about misdiagnosis on the, on those areas uh, when HSPs have have reached out for help, have got a diagnosis, but years later don't feel any relief from from the problems they are experiencing and 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 when they come to a professional that does have knowledge about high sensitivity you see a turning point in in how they look at themselves and how they are able to to overcome their problems and it it really hurts to to realize that there's so many years can can go by yeah just because they didn't have the right perspective on what was causing the problems. 
are being medicated, you know, if you're on meds and it works for you, I am not vilifying medication. So I want to be very, very clear. And if you have some of these things that we've talked about as a diagnosis and it's working for you, I am I am not criticizing that at all. So I want to be very clear no. about that. But I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and ADHD, and I had medication for all of them. And when I went off of medication, I just experienced life very differently. I still struggle with some depression. I'm really curious to know about anxiety because I do tend to run on the anxious side. But when I recognize like, oh, it's my worst case scenario thinking or, oh, this is what my brain does, then it seems to be more manageable with the pandemic, I've definitely had more challenges with executive functioning, and I've had periods where I'm more anxious and more depressed, but it feels like it's much more manageable. Do you have any response to that? I really understand why it feels more manageable, because when you think you have an anxiety disorder, it's it feels like it's sort of outside you. It's, it's not something you can help. Uh, while when you know it's your brain going in overdrive and the best way is to calm it down and to to help your brain uh, get to its normal state you feel much more in control and it feels more just the thought that you, that you do have some control makes you less anxious uh, so i really understand what you're saying we do need to wrap up. I know that we were going to talk a little bit about what to look for in a practitioner and what kinds of things a practitioner should provide. We can either talk about that or if there's something else that I didn't ask you about that's important, I, I do want to give you some time. Well, if we're wrapping up, I, I really want to stress how important it is as, as an HSP to, to know what the trade really entails and to know your talents because especially when you're not in a supportive environment and you well you get some harsh feedback or some some misunderstanding about about you and about your uh, character you can't give it to yourself just by reading about what talents are come from your trait of high sensitivity and to do what we just did to to take the things that that you feel uncomfortable about about yourself or, or things that you have heard from others as being not good about you and to try to uh, turn it around into a talent into a strong aspect of you that can really help you it's so important to yeah to be realistic <laughs> about what it means to be highly sensitive and not uh, being critical about mm -hmm. what it means to be highly sensitive and realistic. When I say realistic, I mean focus on the talents. I love that. Esther, tell us about where people can find you. Tell everybody about both of your books. Your first book is not in English. Is that correct? Yeah, it's only in Dutch. It's about highly sensitive children and how you can raise them and how you can help them in different areas of, of their life. But my second book is about the highly sensitive brain. And I have summarized all the, the brain research that's done with highly sensitive people compared to non-highly sensitive people, but also some brain research from, from different angles to, to get deep insights in how we process things. And I have named 10 talents last chapter. So that might help people to, to recognize them, uh, those talents uh, for themselves. And the book is called The Brain of the Highly Sensitive Person. And it's available on Amazon. And the subtitle is uh, Why You Shouldn't Judge Your Fist by Its Ability to Climb a Tree. To stress that what other people ask of you uh, which you sometimes can't can't deliver can sometimes be because that's not why your talent is. And when you find your talent, that is something to build on and to uh, make you blossom. Yeah, thank you. And why don't you tell the listeners the name of your other book in Dutch because we have listeners in the Netherlands who maybe don't know. Het hoogsensitieve brein. It's exactly what I was thinking. Go ahead. <laughs> Het hoogsensitieve brein is my second book and uh, I have published the third book. It's called Eventjes tijd voor je hoogsensitiviteit. In English, take some time for your high sensitivity. Hmm. It doesn't sound that good in English. <laughs> it sounds in Dutch. Uh, <laughs> but you can find everything on my website, hoogsensitief.com. 
NL, uh, and it contains some English blogs. I, I presume that you will uh, put a link in. Everything will be in the show notes. So if you go to unapologeticallysensitive.com, go to the podcast page and click on Esther's episode, there will be links in the show notes for this, or you can look on your podcast app for the links. Uh, you f- will find a link to the English blogs uh, about my research, different research and different blogs uh, that might interest you. And uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Esther, thank you so much for this conversation. I know the listeners are going to love all of the great research and information that you provided today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. and really enjoyed talking to you again. All right. Have a great day. Hey again. So I'm curious to know what you thought of the episode. After recording this episode, and she talks about Dr. Bianca Acevedo's research work, and Dr. Acevedo was also a guest on the podcast. It really rekindled my desire to have more researchers on the podcast that can really speak to some of the brain-based and hard science around being a highly sensitive person. So I'm going to get working on that. If you're interested in getting a free copy of Esther's book, what I'm going to do is have a giveaway. If you go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com and you go to the survey page, there's a button there that you can click on to sign up for my newsletter. And what I'm going to do is this episode should be coming out sometime in April, and I'm going to give it a week or two to let people sign up for the newsletter. And then I'm going to make the announcement in the next newsletter that goes out who the winner is, and I will send you a free copy of Esther's book called The Brain of the Highly Sensitive Person. You can also go to the link in the show notes, and there are a couple of other places on my website where you can either take the survey or sign up for the most downloaded episodes, and all those will sign you up for my newsletter, but I would love to give you a copy of Esther's book. I hope that you are doing well. I hope that you're having some peace. If you want to get in touch with me, you can reach me at unapologeticallysensitive at gmail.com. We have a closed Facebook group called Unapologetically Sensitive. You can get all of my social media channels at unapologeticallysensitive.com. I'm doing quite a few videos these days on TikTok and reposting to Instagram. I think that's all I have. I hope you are, hmm, what do I hope? I feel like I always say the same things. I just hope you're finding some peace. And since I'm recording this a few months before you're going to hear it, I hope that we have a little bit more health and recovery in the world. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.